From the moment it got out that 2020 was investigating the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, we began to hear from his supporters. Hundreds have contacted us. Some protested his innocence. Some simply urged us to be fair. A few threatened us. But all clearly thought they knew the facts. But do they? We conducted a four-month investigation. And here is what we found. On a cold December day in 1981, Maureen Faulkner buried her husband, Officer Daniel Faulkner. But for 17 years, there has been no closure because of the voice that won't go away. I was driving to work one day, and all of a sudden, I heard this voice, this haunting voice. Promise death, the election is yours. And I could not believe that it was Jamal, on the radio, doing this commentary, I began to shake because I was so upset. Since that day, a few years ago, Maureen Faulkner has waged a crusade against the Free Mumia campaign. She's written a 100-page document attempting to debunk their claims. 2020 has looked at the arguments both she and the Free Mumia movement make on the key points. First, ballistics. Jamal's supporters say the bullet that killed Officer Faulkner was 44 caliber, not a 38 like the gun found at the scene. The bullet is not the size of a, sh of a gun, first thing. They never did any test. The fact that no ballistics tests were done, which is pretty stupid. But ballistic tests were done and proved the bullet was fired by a 38 caliber revolver. The claim that the bullet was a 44 rests solely on a hasty note scribbled by a pathologist at the autopsy. However, the pathologist later testified that he had no expertise in ballistics, that he had only been guessing. But Wineglass refuses to believe that. You don't I think don't it was think a guess? Right. I don't think he would guess. The police say that that slug has the lands and grooves consistent with being a 38 slug. Uh, it does. But if it's a 38, then your contention that the 44 is wrong. Well, I think that issue is very much something that should be played out in front of a jury. But it has already been played out in front of a judge. When three years ago, Wineglass's own ballistics expert testified the fatal bullet was a 38. Wineglass challenges the report of Jamal's hospital confession. And that testimony was produced by the officer's partner plus a security guard who wanted to be a police officer. <laughs> More than two months later, they remembered that Mumia had said that. It is a fact that the confession surfaced only after two months, and that one officer present originally reported the Negro male made no comments. But hospital security guard Priscilla Durham told the jury she reported it to her supervisor the next day. And another security guard, James Legrand, says he too heard the confession. The slain officer's partner, Gary Bell, says the shock of the shooting suppressed his memory. I've searched my soul, I've beaten myself up, wondering how I could not have gone at a sooner date, uh, immediately even, and, and, and report what I had heard. Finally, if there was a plot to fabricate a confession, then it had to include at least the eight people involved in reporting and investigating it. An idea rejected by two separate appeals courts in the last three years. Then, there are the defense eyewitnesses. Leonard Wineglass says four people saw the real killer running from the scene. But his number one witness, William Singletary, waited more than a decade before testifying to a story so bizarre, even Wineglass has trouble defending it. He said, the shooter emerged from the Volkswagen, yelling and screaming, shot Officer Faulkner in the head and ran away. Whereupon, according to Singletary, Abu Jamal approached the scene and said, oh my God, we don't need this, bent over Faulkner, who had been shot between the eyes, and asked, is there anything I could do to help you? Whereupon, according to Singletary, Faulkner's gun, which was in Faulkner's lap, miraculously discharged, hitting Jamal in the chest. Now, that, that's incredible. He might be wrong on some of his timing. There's no doubt about that. Timing? He, he's telling a story here which clearly from the forensic evidence, couldn't have happened. This is my point. The jury should have heard from Singletary. Witness number two was a cab driver parked here in plain view of the murder. As the police arrive, he told one of the arriving officers, I believe a captain, the guy ran away. Those were his first words. 
But the report from which Wineglass quotes goes on to say the shooter didn't get far and then he fell. And Wineglass's third witness, high up in a hotel room one block away, actually insisted that police were already on the scene when she looked out her window. And she did not testify that she saw someone running away, simply that she saw someone running. Uh, yes, which was different well, yeah. slightly than the statement she gave the police. Defense eyewitness number four was a prostitute standing on this corner two blocks away who after 14 years silence claims she saw two men jogging from the scene. She also admits to being in drug lingo, half a nickel bag high. Now, where was she? She was very far. She was, I mean, really, it's actually two streets. It's, I'd say it's beyond a football field. You mean she's as far away as our camera? I can't even see the camera. In contrast, Prosecutor Joe McGill's three key witnesses were all within 50 feet of the shooting and they gave essentially the same statement to three different police officers within 30 minutes of the murder. There is, however, one witness who was even closer, the driver of the Volkswagen, Jamal's brother, William Cook. The only thing that Cook has ever said was, I didn't have anything to do with it, period. Didn't he say, well, my brother didn't do it either? Uh, didn't say my, my brother didn't do it, my brother had a problem, uh, someone else did it get those people down there, they did it, nothing. Why wouldn't he come forward and say, I can tell the truth now to help save my brother's life? He did tell us that. Well, where is he? And we subpoenaed him. Wineglass says Cook was afraid to come forward because he was wanted by police on a minor theft charge. And now, says Wineglass, William Cook is missing. None of these holes in the defense scenario seems to bother Mumia Abu Jamal's supporters. But Philadelphia Mayor Ed Rendell says they should. It's just plain sad how this has become a cause celeb around the world. Look at this. Proclamation, justice from Amir Abdul Jamal Day in San Francisco, signed by Willie Brown, Jr., mayor of San Francisco. They gave him the half-truths, and Willie came up with this proclamation where he made a mistake, clearly. Willie should have picked up the phone and called me. Mayor Brown declined our request for an interview. As for actors Ed Asner and Mike Farrell, while they question Jamal's guilt, they also admit to a larger purpose behind their interest in this case. What do you say to people who say, well, Ed Asner doesn't know anything about this case. He's just using his Hollywood notoriety to try to upset a verdict that has already been rendered. Well, I begin with by saying that I'm anti-death penalty. I think it's a farce. I think uh, the uh, economic disadvantaged are always the ones to die from the death penalty. Even if he were guilty of shooting Officer Faulkner, and even if you thought that was the case, you would say... I would not want him to die. You're up against a very impressive number of people. I know. I am. But I believe that I have the truth on my side. Mumia is nothing but a cold-blooded murderer and they are, have been duped. You know, Ms. Faulkner, bless her. I, I, I really wish for her uh, peace at some point. And if, in fact, a new trial holds that Mumia Abu Jamal committed this crime, I hope he is punished appropriately. Mumia! Mumia! And no matter what they do to me, they ain't stop me. Because revolution is my religion. To his most zealous disciples, Mumia Abu Jamal is a prophet. To call him a murderer is sacrilege. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and... People are not just going to sit back and let another Malcolm X be murdered and uh, another Martin Luther King. Just like Jesus Christ, they were all freedom fighters and they were all killed by this government. Won't you help to sin? Might this be Mumia Abu Jamal's Song of Freedom? Or is it rather a lesson in the power of propaganda? Tell a lie, tell it big enough, tell it often enough, and it becomes truth. And that's just what happened in this case. We wanted to interview Jamal on camera, but were denied access by the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Jamal's attorney is appealing that denial in court, and if access is granted, Jamal says he will do the interview, but only after ABC's current labor dispute is settled. In the meantime, for Mumia Abu Jamal, there is still a potential for Supreme Court review. 
and it's impossible to say when his death sentence might be carried out. As for Maureen Faulkner, she says she's been harassed by Jamal's supporters. She fears for her life and has relocated far from Philadelphia.